Well, it's time now that we go across town to the delightfully air-cooled, beautifully appointed the gourmet club. Ray, uh, yes. you know that young squirt that we hired last week? Wilbur Conley? Yes, he just handed me a note saying that the gourmet club has moved temporarily while they're redecorating. Did that young squirt move it on his own? Huh? Uh, no, he had nothing to do with it, but they're next door, so it may sound a little bit different. I don't know if their microphones are All right, check. then, and thank you, Wilbur, for telling us, and so we take you to our two correspondents at the gourmet club. Good afternoon, and good morning, and good afternoon. We are broadcasting from a gourmet club. Not the regular one, however. We have had to move because of the heating plant that broke down at the beautifully appointed regular gourmet club. And while they're repairing that and painting and other decorations, uh, we have kindly been given the facilities of a restaurant next door. All of the regular members of the gourmet club are here, together with quite a few others, and everyone seems to be enjoying themselves. Uh, that's right. Uh, this is a Chinese chop house. We're in uh, steaks, the french fries, uh, the a principal uh, main attraction, although uh, Chinese uh, dishes will be served if you uh, so desire. The annual feature of the day will be the Gourmet Club Egg Roll, in which everyone will participate, and uh, we hope have a good time. All the uh, younger fry uh, uh, who make up part of our membership will participate in that. Uh, looking about the room, I notice... Uh, uh, let me see. Charlie Chan is here. Uh, Sabu is uh, here, too, today. Uh, Von Monroe uh, has joined the happy singing at the stage. You can uh, probably hear our dear friend. Well, there's the fanfare which signals the arrival of our sandwich surprise, uh, the sandwich of a famous person to be opened in public ceremony. Gee whiz, Harry. I wonder would it be possible for them to quiet down uh, during the opening of the sandwich. <clears throat> thank they, uh, you. Certainly have heard us because they have quieted down considerably. We want to thank the uniformed guide for bringing the sandwich up on the stage. It's in a brown paper bag in waxed paper. We open that. And first of all, do you have the envelope, Harry? Yes, the envelope has been torn open, and uh, the sandwich belongs to Bill Boyd, uh, Hopalong Cassidy. Well, uh, fair enough. Uh, his sandwich is beaten biscuit and ham. Well, congratulations to Bill uh, Boyd. <clears throat> you can hear a buzz uh, throughout the gourmet club at the announcement of the sandwich uh, belonging to Bill Boyd. Now, as everyone resumes uh, their gay festivities here, the dancing begins once again, and it's just about time to say goodbye. And on this happy, pleasant note, uh, sincere wishes uh, uh, from the Gourmet Club but to you all. And in turn, immediately switching to Belfast, Maine. Scene today of the famous Belfast Balloon Ascension and correspondent W.W. Ballou and Artie Skirmahorn. Ballou Ballou with Artie Skirmahorn speaking here from the town park in Belfast, Maine, where the annual balloon ascension is about to take place. The balloon... Uh, over there is being inflated right at the present moment, and I think Artie Skirmahorn is in a better position to see just how far uh, it has gone to this point. Will you come in, Artie? Horn here, and it's just about ready now to go into the air. Uh, I was talking with the uh, chairman of the get-together today. He tells me that there will be approximately 100 pounds of uh, stuff for going into that balloon. And he didn't say what type of chemical it is. Hello here. Excuse me, Artie, but uh, I think it was 500 pounds because normal anybody knows that they could get the balloon off the ground uh, without uh, sufficient pressure. Well, I, uh, back here, I don't mean to interrupt you again, uh, Wally, but uh, I am of the opinion that it's less than that. However, maybe you have figures a little later than mine. <laughs> yeah, well taken. Malou, and uh, I can see from here that I think they're about to wave the flag, which means they have inflated it to the extremity they have planned. Uh, the fellow is looking at the basket. 
Well, well not too bad. What do you see from there, Artie? Anything? It just uh, disintegrated completely. Nobody's hurt or anything, <laughs> but it's just ruined. They have a spare, I'm told, and they will get to work on that right away and start inflating the second one. The townsfolk are now walking slowly toward their home. Take you now somewhere in Manhattan and do a sightseeing bus. All right, folks, if you'll just sit back and relax now, we're traveling down Fifth Avenue, which is known as one of the main thoroughfares of Manhattan, east of Fifth, uh, the numbers are called Clarence. east, west of Fifth. Clarence, uh, yes. This is Madison Avenue. I don't mean to correct you in front of uh, all moving these. Down Madison Avenue here, we're going south and we'll be turning right in just a few moments Clarence, on to Clarence, we're traveling north and we'll have to make a left turn up here at an even number street. <laughs> we'll make a left turn on a westbound street. All of the westbound streets go uh, west and the eastbound streets go east. Therefore, if we're going north, we make a left uh, I'm turn. I'm afraid you're wrong. I have a little uh, rule of thumb I use, uh, even east. Uh, will you tend to your driving, please, Harry, and let me tend to my sightseeing thought? I know, but I can't. Over there, them. you'll see the site of uh, one of the most famous uh, restaurants here in New York, and I don't remember the name of it. Uh, they well, I don't think the sign could be much bigger, Clarence. The sign was taken down, Harry, to be repaired earlier this week. Well, we've always noticed. passed it every day of our lives. Now we're for crossing Fifth years. Avenue, ladies and gentlemen. Up uh, to the right, you'll see Central Park. Uh, stretches for a good many blocks uh, from 59th Street uh, North and a uh, good many, well, not a good many, about three blocks from uh, Fifth Avenue West, I think. I'll check that for you. Uh, if you just slow down a little bit, Harry, you're going a I little too... You, you describe what we're passing, I'll do the driving, Clarence. I think that would be a fair arrangement. That's what I've been trying to do, Harry, uh, ever since we set out on this trip. You're absolutely the worst person to work with on one of these sightseeing tours that I've ever had the... Uh, I think if you uh, describe to the people who are purchasing no, we're just what we're doing here, I think they'd, they'd think they were getting more for their money than listening to you uh, uh, argue with me, Clarence. We're turning uh, left into what is known as the Great White Way. It is not there. the Great White Way. It will be ten blocks before at the You're Great right, White Harry. You're right. I did make a mistake on that. It looked like Times Square to me, uh, but it wasn't. It was uh, Columbus Circle. And over there you'll see the uh, preparations for a great uh, amphitheater. And a, That's the statue of Christopher Columbus, everybody. The circle is named after Christopher Columbus, obviously. And anyone who'd ever seen his picture or his statue would know uh, who is that fellow in the statue. Hold on to your hats. I'm going to make a right turn. We're turning right now. And right here we have three gentlemen, two uh, garbed in native Bernice or Bernouses, and the third, uh, an interpreter for this group of uh, Arabians. Is that right, sir? You are Mr. Spivak, aren't you? That's right. And you have brought these, uh, this ace Arabian drill team to this country. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the aim of uh, this tour? Close on the drill. And they do some of the most unusual close-order drilling that I've ever seen. I'll say that for them. I saw them rehearsing. They uh, do all the customary left, right faces by the right flank, column right, column left, with a few to the wind's march. You're the uh, interpreter for them. You do speak uh, Arabian, is that right? Yes, I do. I'll give the commands and tell you what I just said. All right. Well, now, how many are there in this uh, drill team? Eighteen. Eighteen. And they're all lined up? A small platoon. Standing at attention there. And what is the first thing we will hear, Mr. Spivak? This. Very hard. Well, the leader. <coughs> I've just said, given the order. Oh, it's March. Very hard. That was by the left flank of March. Very hard. Well, now, two, on, two on each end are going off to the wing. Oh, well, Hunt, Hope, Hip, Ford. Yes, sounds a little familiar. I notice that the two on each end, now there's two more on each end, have dropped off and gone into the wings. Well, that was my fault. Uh, that leaves ten. 
There are ten of these eight Arabian uh, drill team members. Perfect! Or rather, eight left on stage there. Perfect! By the left flank, Barnes. Now, four to one side. All right! A very complicated maneuver here, that I should... keep in step. Well, now, there are four, four just one on off the stage right there, didn't they? Yes. The, very small The two stage. members of the team are still marching here and... Perfect! Where did that other one go? Run off to the wing. I'm all alone here. i got to bring myself oh, to I, a halt. Oh, that's you. Hey, I just uh, said halt to me. Well, very good. Uh, I understood that last command there. Uh, where do you expect to take these uh, people? Well, just before we went on the air, we had a call from Ed Sullivan, like it's on his... On the show? His television show. Oh, well, swell. Well, I hope that you have a great deal of success if you can find them. And they'll be all right. Right. Thanks, Mr. Spivak. Spotlight on the advertising field now. As I understand it, I just met this gentleman a few minutes before we went on the air. What is your name? Uh, Stephen Delfinity. <laughs> Mr. Delfinity, uh, what is it that you do that is connected with advertising? I train dogs for the <clears throat> advertising agency. Well, now, this is uh, kind of doesn't make sense, uh, just hearing it off the bat like this. So just how does this work? Well, it's uh, principally... Uh... You're Bob, right? That's right. It's principally Bob for the advertising agencies who sponsor football games. Uh, what I do is I train uh, dogs to be used at those games. You train dogs to be used at football at games? At football games. Well, uh, this uh, demands a little more explanation, I think. Uh, how do you do it, and oh, uh, what do you train uh, them for? Uh, yes. Uh, what I do is I have all types of dogs. I have uh, carcass spaniels. I have a big boxer I use in big bull games. I have uh, several types of dogs. What I do is I train them to run on the field and delay the game so that they can get more commercials in during the actual football game. Oh, and I see now... Uh, I think they can stay on the field from uh, four to six minutes. I have them trained... So as they can elude uh, those who try to chase the sewers. Oh, they couldn't catch my dog. Well, now, <laughs> after they get about two or three extra commercials in. Well, after they have uh, stayed on the field and run around and uh, evaded everybody, how, how do they know enough to uh, come off the field? I'm way in back of the hot dog stand with a very high whistle that only the dogs can hear. When I let that go, the dog comes right over. And then uh, they all congratulate me for getting the dog off. <laughs> so it works both ways. I get congratulations from the referee and, uh, and kudos from the advertising agency. I see. When's your first game this year? Uh, September 15th. Well, that's good, and I hope you have a lot of success with it. Thank you we'll very much. We'll be looking for your efforts out there. Thanks, Ray. We'll see them. Bob. Bob. No doubt. Our agricultural spotlight is one of the directors of the Lackawanna Field Station, our old friend Dean Archer Armstead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dean, if you'd uh, just uh, swivel the chair around oh. so that you're facing <laughs> into the microphone, I'm sure we get a lot more out of this. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Evan knows it's uh, difficult enough. I am just recently returned from a whole seminar that we uh, held up in New York State. And uh, um, I was uh, going to ask you about that because I know that they introduced a great many of the new uh, innovations in haying. Uh, well, one is that square baler. That's right. Uh, we're trying to show the advantages to the farmer of using this machine. I see. Well, what are some of the advantages? Can you uh, well, for one thing, uh, um, um, you need not. Uh, Cut your hair and then wait for it to dry. What you do is you let your hair dry naturally on the ground. On the ground before you cut it. But there's one one machine. And uh, don't, don't, don't move that. Um, they, in other words, they cut the hay, they leave it on the ground uh, as it's cut, and then this baler goes. The baler's machine have cut it, uh, bales it, and then stacks it neatly. Uh, as it goes along, it saves so many steps and makes the the hay farmers uh, life a lot more more easy. I should imagine. Well, now, of course, we're coming into fall, and this is going to be mulching season. Can you give any tips on that for the farmers who? Well, I, I, I'd like to sum it up this way, Bob. When in doubt, mulch. By that I mean you can never over mulch. 
And uh, now certainly the season when the knuckles break the week, way. when the uh, summer will definitely be on the wane. Sure. Well, okay, Dean, and we'll be looking for you as a regular feature in the uh, weeks ahead. I hope that uh, everything up at the experimental station is going uh, according to Hoyle and that you have success with the things you're working on. I certainly hope so, and I know it will appreciate by a little bit of so, Good afternoon, everyone. Dean, put your arms. Well, this week, I suppose you're wondering, where has Wally Ballou gone? Well, we'll tell you. He's in Grand Junction, Colorado, where he's interviewing businessmen, small businessmen. And uh, as we look in on him now in the tape report, this is one he sent back earlier this week, he was talking with a shoe repairman. So come in, Wally Ballou. This is Walt Ballou speaking to you from Salvatore Bagatelli's shoe repair shop. Mr. Bagatelli has told me that he can take a few moments out to explain just what he is trying to do here and how business is from a small standpoint. Mr. Bagatelli? When will I hang up my leather apron? I'll be right there. I'm standing about six feet in from the door, which leads to the street. And I'm just filling there. Uh, Mr. Bagatelli, uh, how many shoes do you repair in a day? I can put soles on uh, 20 shoes. I can put soles and heels on 15 shoes. I can put just heels on almost 35 shoes. Is that pairs or singles, sir? Well, uh, actually, on the heels, it would be 34 and a half. And uh, here at my shop, I insist that my men do the right shoe first, and then the left shoe, just so that we can stack them up on the shelves in proper order and sequence. I see great banks of machinery behind you. That's right. Those are trimmers and cutters, uh, filer downers, and like that. I see. How long have you been in this small business of repairing shoes? I have uh, been doing this for a good many years. It's nothing new for me, uh, being a shoe repair man. I've gone through a whole, uh, whole different uh, range hey. of shoe styles down through the years. Hey, I don't... something just caught my eye over here on the ready rack. Yeah. This, this little set of tiny shoes can't be more than three, four inches long. They're not children's shoes. They're not grown-up shoes. Whose shoes are those? Well, these little pair, these little shoes here, yeah. they, they were in for... Uh, With their turned-up toes on them. With a little bell. So old and here. A little fella comes in from the hills. He wears a little hat, funny hat, and a green suit made out of velvet. He comes in here about once a year and has these shoes fixed up, puts uh, soles and heels on them. Does he have an antenna on his head? Uh, I have, he has a funny thing on the top of his head, yes. Well, have you noticed anything unusual about him? By that I mean... Well, he doesn't speak uh, English, I know that. He just comes in and grunts a few orders to me, and uh, he has an unusual-looking gun, uh, sidearm type of thing. It looks like a flashlight, but uh, I see him wither a lot of flowers as he walks down the street with it. Might be kind of a disintegrator ray, huh? I don't know whatever that would be, but he's a funny little fella, and I don't mess with him. Well, you mind your own business, Mr. Bagatelli. You mind your own, too. No, fella. I didn't mean you. I mean that's a good uh, philosophy to follow. And now this is Walt Ballou returning you to Bob and Ray in New York. Now, once again, time to call in Wally Ballou, who is at an egg-dying factory up in uh, New York State. So come in, Wally Ballou, at Rensselaer, New York. Lou at Rensselaer, New York. And uh, here it's a scene of activity as eggs are being dyed various colors in their uh, fine shells. And uh, everybody is just uh, having a wonderful time. The... The... Uh, manager of the plant has just given uh, an order to a line of egg dyers over at the far side. Now he's coming over toward our microphone. Uh, How you I'm Marvin Naismith. Mr. Naismith, uh, we've just been marveling at the activity of the gay panorama of colors that greeted our eye when we stepped inside here. Well, it's a happy scene as we dye these eggs every year. Uh, I'd like to point out, of course, that the dyes we use are quite poisonous. 
That is probably something you don't want to advertise too, uh, too strongly. I'd like to keep this just between you and myself and whatever network you're on. I might point out that I've invited along the stockholders in my organization for this broadcast. And obviously they approve of uh, my straightforwardness in announcing promptly that the dyes we use are poisonous. Well, your eggs then aren't sold for consumption in any way. No, they're more for just rolling on the lawn or for just looking at uh, about 20 feet. Uh, I would not you advise... You mean they're dangerous if you get within 20 feet of them? You should not handle them unless you're wearing gloves, and I would uh, recommend steel gloves of some sort. Well, I notice that all of those people over there are wearing uh, coverall-type uniforms with uh, headgear that covers their whole head. That's and... all lead-lined, uh, all uniforms. You can't go near these eggs unless you're very well protected from them. That's right. Do you find you have quite a lot of satisfied users uh, for your product? Uh, yes, we have... Uh... We have uh, a list every year. We send out about 12 people by these who own, fortunately, uh, lead uniforms that uh -huh. enables them to have fun with these eggs uh, at this time. Uh-huh. Well, now here is the familiar ceremony, which I understand is stat here at your factory. The ceremony you uh, pull off every year about this time when you... Toss the eggs into the boat outside the factory. Is that That's right? right. And then they float down across the pond and are gathered over there by a group of co workers who ship them uh, in uh, lead automobiles and trucks uh, down to New York and other large metropolitan population centers here in the east, midwest, far west, south. North. We've certainly enjoyed talking to you, Mr. Naismith, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to come back and find next year that your business has increased a great deal. Good luck to you, too. And Donut Week is with us again. And in celebration, we've dispatched Wally Ballou to a donut factory here to find out what makes donuts tick. Come in, Wally Ballou. Wally Ballou speaking to you from a typical donut factory just outside of Newark, New Jersey, where donuts are being made by the thousands. Donuts, which we'll be eating at our breakfast tables or what have you, probably early this week. I'd like to speak with the manager of this donut factory and see if we can find out if... Uh, sir, would you come over here, please? Welcome to the donut factory, Mr. Below. It's always a pleasure to meet you and your friendly cohorts. Sure to meet you, too, sir. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Well, we're standing right here now. We're... Making up a batch of bread donuts and knocking the middles out of them. You can pro this lady. What happens to those middles, incidentally? It's a question that's been asked of me quite a few times. Well, we roll them up into a big ball and make more donuts and then knock the middle out of them again. And then you have a uh, few little... Then we have a little ball left. We roll that in, make some more donuts and knock the middle out of that. And finally, what's left kind of kind of disappears like what? Well, what do you do with that? You probably get down to one left, don't you? Uh, well, that's right. To turn on the machine, Eddie, we can't waste a minute. Right. Uh, what we do is uh, the little bits, we fry them off, and they're like squares. Uh -huh. And uh, we pass them around to the factory here where the visitor's going through. Interesting. You've got the place decked out with colored bunting, too, I see. Uh, that's right. This week we'll be making all kinds of donuts, jelly donuts filled with cream, uh, some of them uh, with sugar on them, some of them uh, with uh, icing, vanilla icing, chocolate icing, orange icing, lime okay, icing. Okay, with... then. Thanks very much for this visit and this interesting discussion of how donuts are made. Wally Ballou returning you to New York. Well, we thought it might be nice and interesting today to get a cross-section of uh, views on the coming holiday down on the streets. So. That's right, and so we thought we'd call in correspondent W. Ballou, who's down there. W. Ballou, standing here at the corner of uh, Rockefeller Plaza and 49th Street in good old Manhattan, or New York City. I'm going to see if I can pick somebody out. The traffic is pretty well styled up and not moving whatsoever. Let me go over here by this uh, sleigh pulled up here. How about you, sir? Would you have a few words while you're parked there? Yes, very glad to. 
Very nice to see you. You look as if you're in the holiday mood. Yes, I am. What uh, strikes you most about Christmas this year in Manhattan? Well, the lack of snow. (laughs) That makes it pretty tough. Well, there's enough snow for a sleigh, you see. Uh Uh-huh. That's been the big problem with me. I like to travel around in this sleigh with my reindeer. Uh, I noticed uh, you had uh, eight of them there. Yes, that's the Pinto. That's the... The Nina? Nina. And the Maria there. Uh-huh. And so forth. That uh, suit you're wearing... That's red. That's imitation white ermine. That the uh-huh. cops are around the neck. And you've... You laugh like a bowl full of jelly there, I know that. <laughs> well, that's what they say. What do you do, sir? What line of work is? I, uh, in the toy business, uh-huh. primarily. I deliver toys at this time of the year uh-huh. to uh, children in my, uh, my world. I see. Well, I see the traffic is beginning to move, and, uh, hope you'll be able to get through okay. Well, I hope so, and I want to thank you for coming by. Is this been on the radio? Yes, it has. <laughs> you got a cold? Little bit. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. Good luck to you, sir. <laughs> Notice uh, how I laugh like a bowl of jelly? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is Wally Baloo returning you to... I wanted, uh... To say you order a glass of beer, uh, how would I go about that? Well, I think that's uh, very simple. You'd uh, indicate to the gentleman uh, behind the the bar uh, your desires. I think that would be the easiest way. If he didn't hear you, then you might yell to him to get his attention. Hi, right, does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other uh, questions? My, uh, my question is this. Like, when my, after I've been overhauling a cable, like, and my hands are all dirty, when I meet a lady, do I shake hands with her? You know? It's the correct thing to... Or do uh, I, should I, uh, say, well, I'd shake hands with your lady, but I've been overhauling a cable and my hands are filthy. No, I think you can overcome uh, the problem very graciously and uh, very easily if you should uh, wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water before... Soap and water. ...before uh-huh. uh, meeting the lady at the appointed uh, place. I see. Then you can shake hands or whatever. Uh-huh. But uh, it would be correct uh, before your date to... Uh, have the hands washed with soap. Well, if it's a regular date, I mean, I'd know the girl and... It doesn't make any difference. Well, I mean, if this is a strange lady that I just met, I mean, uh, what would I do? I hope I'm... Well, you're not quite uh, making yourself clear, sir. Well, let's say I just finished overhauling this here cable. Yes, all right. And I come up and uh, a friend of mine says, uh, Freddy, I said, I'd like you to, to meet so-and-so. It's a lady. And what would I do? I mean, shake hands with her or go wash my hands, like you say, with soap and water. Well, you wouldn't, uh, as soon as he said, I would like to have you meet my lady friend, you wouldn't immediately say, excuse me, I'm going to wash my hands with soap and water. You would say, how do you do? Try gracefully not to shake hands with her. Or nothing. Uh, If I have these dirty hands and I want to buy a tie, I mean, I go into a tie store. Do I dare... No, I know. Handle the ties? No, you sh- you shouldn't touch uh, merchandise at all with those uh, greasy hands. All right, quiz, quiz up for me. Thank you. Now, uh, it's about all the question time we have, but if you'll be thinking of any more, uh, the next time we're back here, we'll try to answer some more. Backstage here at the Leanhurst Theater in the dressing room of one of its... Uh, Second stars, I would say, would be the uh, correct phraseology, wouldn't it, Lawrence? I hope so. Uh, I suppose it would be, yes. When did this play open? It opened uh, Friday, and uh, it closed uh, Friday. Oh, it's already closed. You're just here to pick up your uh, clothes and things and... Oh, that's right. I'm, uh, well, we have to leave the costumes here because they don't belong to us, but... Mm-hmm. How uh, long have you rehearsed for I to get my shaving equipment and my own makeup kit. How long did you rehearse for this uh, play, The Good Scene? Well, uh, we went into rehearsal in February, 
Uh-huh. And uh, we rehearsed all summer. I see. And uh, then you had the part of uh, a butler, as I understand it, didn't you? That's right. The, uh, the whole play, the mystery, hinged on a speech of mine in the third act. Could you recall that speech for us? Yes. Well, I'm... I couldn't recall it during the play. Well, I remember reading about that in the reviews. They said that you and quite a few of the others of the cast forgot lines. Well, that uh, probably was the uh, the biggest fault with the production was that we all forgot our lines. And uh, Didn't the opening night performance run something like five and a half hours? It was a little longer. The curtain went up at 20 minutes to nine, and the show didn't let out till 10 after one. Mm-hmm. Well, now, you don't remember right now what that line was that the whole play hinged on that you forgot. Uh, I'm trying to remember it now. I, I couldn't remember it at all. That's why the play was such a dismal failure. You were was, supposed to come in and was, say who did it. And yes, and I uh, came in, and I pointed uh, at all the suspects on the stage and said, they all did it. And, the, uh, of course, the man playing the police commissioner had no answer for that. Well, he, he, he didn't remember his lines anyway. I wasn't... Uh, it was pretty frightening. And, uh, uh, of course, the critics had left during yeah. the first act. Well, what are you going to do now, Lawrence? Will you be going back on Broadway? No, or? I've had my fill of it. I see. Thank you very much. So long from the Leanhurst Theater. How would you like to make extra money in your spare time for a profitable hobby that can develop into a lucrative business? It's alligators, the small, clean, scaly animals that are literally worth their weight in gold. Now, they can be raised in a spare room, basement, or garage. It takes only a few minutes a day to care for a pair, and it costs only a few pennies a day to feed each animal. Alligators breed once a year and have one to five eggs at a time. They wipe clean with a damp cloth. Now, the pair that you're going to get from Alligator Industries are completely guaranteed producers, all pedigreed and registered. Now, we would like to point out that you can make all sorts of things from these animals, suitcases, shoes, watch bands, many other expensive articles. Now, we'll help you get started, folks, and show you how to make substantial profits in alligator raising. We'll supply you with two alligator eggs and complete information on the feeding, raising, housing, and breeding of alligators. Oh, and don't forget, Ray, alligator eggs are sturdy, they're uh, easy to handle, and they're as light as ping pong balls. Now then, for the free booklet on alligator raising, with no obligation whatsoever, write to Slimy New York. And as a special bonus for the first 100 to order alligator eggs, we're going to send absolutely free a one-week supply of vitamin-enriched alligator food. Remember, no alligator salesman will call at your home. I just wish you could see our uh, studio here, all bedecked with bunting of uh, varied colors. And uh, we're chatting with Miss Gladys Gayhart of Elkhart, Indiana. Just a minute, Miss Gayhart, we're introducing you. Uh, she is a member of the group here uh, in convention in New York City. And having their actual convention here in the studio, uh, Miss uh, Gayhart, will you tell us just what it is that you folks collect? Miniature wastebaskets, the tiniest type possible. And I have, as to repeat, been collecting them now for 15 years. This you have your total I... collection right here on this board, uh, be decked with bunting and various uh, decorative effects here. There must be, what, eight or nine there. There are 12. 12 miniature wastebaskets. And uh, you see this one here, I'll point to it. Mm-hmm. That is all hand-carved leather. Not much bigger than a, than a thimble, is it? That's reputed. No, it's actually smaller, I'd say, than the ordinary thimble. Now, this is reputed to be almost 3,000 years old. Is that so? Uh, well, what did they do with the uh, miniature wastebaskets 3,000 years ago? Oh, well, they threw tiny things in them. Mm-hmm. Well, now, how many of you are here in convention uh, at New York for this... Uh, well, weekend? there are four of us who collect these. Four from various parts of the United States. And how, how Three many... Three from the United States, one from the British Isles. Is that so? Uh, and what does the total collection include? How many miniature wastebaskets do you have? You well, know? about 19, including. And we think that there are two more somewhere in the world. Isn't that interesting? I think that uh, this is and real that wonderful. dye, the dye on this, that... Purple yes. or bluish. Yeah. Well, I see our time is up, Miss oh. Gayhart. I hope you have a wonderful time here in New York, and thanks for talking on our microphone. You're welcome.
Let's go to the Kalamazoo Zoo and W.W. Ballou. W.W. Ballou at the Kalamazoo Zoo. As you may remember, a few weeks ago, Captain Bart McAllister was our guest. Uh, the very same Captain McAllister, after a rather unfortunate accident with a boa constrictor, out of the hospital and back here with us today. Captain, how do you feel? Pretty good, uh, Bob, or what's his name? Uh, Wally. Wally. You look and... as if you're in uh, peak condition and fine shape. Well, I'm still a little weak, but uh, what I want to do is get my nerves back if I possibly can. Uh, this is my first day out of the hospital after letting that boar constrictor wrap himself around my chest. And uh, usually I can throw them off by expanding my chest, but uh, that fellow was particularly uh, That strong. was uh, Log John, if I remember was his name. That's right. And uh, you do this three times a day at the uh, Kalamazoo Zoo, is that right? Uh, that's right. This is my first time back, though, and I hope to do the first show. First show, and then that's all for the day, and then tomorrow I'll take the regular three. All right. Well, now, Long John is in this big crate over here. Do you want to open it up, and we'll... All watch. right. Well, it's good to see you again, Long John. Long John is nodding, and uh, oh, Captain McAllister is... Oh, he's wrapping himself around my he, chest now. He does that automatically, doesn't he? That's right. He's applying a little pressure now. Uh, Soon I'll expand my chest and flip him right off. Well, this is one of the most daring feats of bravery in the... Uh, Any minute now, I'll just... In any zoo that we've seen. Uh, sorry that Marlon Perkins isn't here to view this today, too. With us, it's a scene of panoramic beauty as I stand here. Um, Long John is... Captain? Help me. Get him on. Captain? Get him on. Is somebody W. Blue returning is? Get him on. 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 Get him you said your name was McGonagall, is that right? That's right, I did. It would be Tiki McGonagall, and what is this hobby of yours that has been Well, it's hardly a hobby anymore, uh, Mr. Uh, Elliot. Elliot. Uh, it's my livelihood now. You I train... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You devote your full time to this? Then? Yes. Well, it's a full time job. I train butterflies, and I use a whip. You train butterflies with a whip? That's right. Well, now, just, uh... What, I, I, what I'd you... like to point out that I never have hit one, because if I hit a butterfly with a whip, I'd have an enemy for life. In other words, it's somewhat like the lion tamer who goes into the cage with a chair and a blank cartridge pistol. You don't really, uh, intend to harm the animal, or do you call I've it... I've never known a mean butterfly in my life. How long have you been doing this, uh, Tiki? Well, uh, it started off as a kid when I, uh first noticed butterflies, and I uh -huh. thought that maybe I could help them by teaching them things, come and go, wow. and eat at certain regular intervals, and to enjoy life a little more than flying around. Well, I had always been under the impression that butterflies enjoy themselves to the fullest uh, without any help well, from humans. I, well, who, who is to say, you know, and I it took it upon myself to instruct these little things, and worked out wonderfully for them and for me. I, I like oh, them a lot. I, you mean that the butterflies have changed in the last... Uh... Oh, in the last 15, 20 years, whereas, uh, say, a butterfly born in 1911 could look forward to a year of life. Uh, now, a butterfly born today can live two years, maybe. Is that so? Are there right. any difference in size? Are they more they're, robust? They're bigger now. They're stronger butterflies than they used to be. And uh, they're healthier generally, I think. As you I've told me just before we went on the air, too, that you thought they were taller now than they used to be. Oh, yes, you're a good deal taller. Uh, and uh, well, what is all this stronger? They, they, they withstand uh, uh, winds mm. a lot better than they used to. They used to mm. flop around in them. Mm. What's all this going to lead to, Tiki? By that I mean... Uh, what do you plan to do after training as many butterflies as is possible for you? Well, there's nothing much to do with them, except start over with a new class. I'm starting a new class now. I bring in a new crowd. Crop. 
Well, well, thanks very much for coming up here with you. You might notice that I ride around in a Roman chariot pulled by 12 of the most beautiful butterflies you've That's ever right, seen. That's right, he does, ladies and gentlemen. And right now he's taking his net and going out through the huge studio doors here. Bye, everybody. In a chariot drawn by 14 beautiful butterflies. Thank you very much. You're entirely Thank welcome. You. Goodbye, everybody. Just before we went on the air today, we selected a member of our studio audience who answered the question, what is my most exciting experience? And I think we have a lady who's had a very exciting one, uh, Ms. Flannel. Uh, is it Ms. or Ms.? It's Ms. Flannel. All right, Mother, well, will you tell us... Now, just a moment. Hmm? Do not call me Mother. I hate this patronizing manner well, that so many radio and television masters of ceremonies well, have. I understand. If they have a lady over 30 years... Immediately call her mother. Well, it's gone I back to, to the it. history of radio. I would radio. much prefer you call me Miss Flannel. Well, all right, Miss Flannel. Uh, what is your most exciting experience? Well, it happened just barely ten months ago. I was on a train between New York City and Albany, New York. Yes. We were gone about 15, 20 minutes, just up above West Point, riding along, when suddenly I couldn't believe my eyes. Riding down from the hill country to our left, I could discern a group of Indians. And they were armed with rifles of gold. And they had passed the train. Indians had passed the train. Everybody seek cover. Red down as long as you can. Get away from the window. We were so Sorry excited. To you, I Bob and Ray. Oh, there she Come along, Ma Flannel, now. Oh, there's Come the along. nice doctor. Well, Bob right. and Ray, I have to run along now. Say goodbye. Come along. Good goodbye, everybody. Right, right this way. Who was that fellow? I don't know, but he sure ruined a perfectly wonderful dramatic Why, bit there. She had me really believing that for a while there. Yeah, me too, and she had the dramatic department all warmed up, the sound effects and everything. <gasps> oh, well. Hmm? Hey, boy, have we got a terrific announcement to make now, huh? That's right, folks. Bob and Ray have another blockbuster for you. Remember we've told you about the big warehouse that's always bursting with war surplus bargains? Well, last night it burst, and what a mess. But our loss is your game. We have exactly 164 bayonets, complete with scabbards, which were never used in the war. They were sent back from Cuba right after the Battle of San Juan Hill, absolutely untouched. And that's not all. We have 226 pair of canvas leggings, which were only used once at the Battle of San Juan Hill. What's more, these leggings were used only going up the hill, not down. And we have 314 pair of heavy-duty campaign boots, sizes 12, 14, and 17. Now, some of these pairs match, and all of them have only slight mud stains from San Juan Hill. That's not all. We have 36 flagpoles, which fit the hand perfectly. If you have a flag and plan to run up San Juan Hill waving it on your vacation... Don't miss this bargain. Hey, listen to this, two fans. We have left exactly 22 slightly used ammunition wagons, which were damaged just a bit when they slid back down San Juan Hill. A few nails here and there, some bicycle tape, a coat of paint, a little grease, and you can take your own ammunition wagon with you uh, during your vacation. And finally, we have 124 full cases of canned corned beef, which are clearly stamped San Juan Hill 1898 on the tops of the cans. Now, if you do not find this corned beef all you hope it to be, just leave word for the executor of your estate to return the remaining unopened cans to us. So if you want to snap up some of these terrific war surplus bargains, you just write today to Teddy Roosevelt, Care of New York. Once again, it's Bob and Ray lucky phone call time when we select a number scientifically from our phone books of various cities throughout the United States and call the lucky one who is selected. Ray, have you picked out uh, the city first of all? Well, the lucky city, Bob, is uh, right here. Looks like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, eh, Ray? And if you'll hand me the number there, I'll dial it. Our operators are standing by ready to put the call right Three, through. Six, six, eight, two, two. Okay. And it's buzzing now. I hope they're home because this is a lucky phone call. Hello? Hello. Is this 
Mike Zeber? No, this is Leo Plumeritis. Well, we were calling Lancaster 36682. That's right. Have we the right number? Uh, that's right. I just moved into this house just oh, recently. Oh, I see. Well, Mr. Zeber must be out then. Uh, this oh, is... well, this is my house. Oh. This is the Plumeritis household now. Bob and Ray calling from New York. How do you do? This is our lucky phone call for today. Well, isn't that wonderful? It certainly is, and uh, hey, do you realize... This is a, a lucky phone call. Looks like we want something. wonder uh, if you realize how many chances, how, how big the odds are that we should happen to pick you, Mr. Plumwriter. Well, I imagine out of the millions of registered phones in America to have you call me, the odds would be pretty staggering. We have them all here on our... T- is Ms. Plumwriter there with you? Well, she's uh, busy right now. Uh-huh. She's putting some icing on the cake. We have all of our uh, phone numbers here on the stage and we picked them scientifically, as you know, if you've ever I heard know, the program. I know, we've been listening. Uh, well, See, well, I, I'm an apple dipper down here. I make candy apples. Uh, oh, very uh, interesting. Daddy's our big day. I dip well, them here in the kitchen. And, uh, it's a big seller in the fall, isn't it? Around oh, Thanksgiving and Halloween time. Uh, my wife would like to know what we want. <laughs> what? <laughs> my wife, she wants to know what we want. We're well, lucky. you didn't win anything, sir. We just happened to call you, and uh, the odds are so great that you are lucky that it was you. Uh-huh. And uh, we want to wish you all the very best, and thank you for talking to us today over the telephone. been a real pleasure, Mr. Plumeritis, and uh, you'll hear from us by mail. Well, thank you. We'll inform uh, you by letter. Oh, yes, I our lucky phone call. This is unusual, huh? Right on. Bye, bye. bye. Well, you know, there's been an awful lot of talk about uh, the government projecting off into space a new satellite, a moon type of satellite. And not to be outdone, we at uh, Bob and Ray Laboratories have been quite busy in the last uh, week or two. Well, actually, we didn't do all the work at the laboratories. It was down in my cellar, and we have made up a satellite sun so that we hope... Uh, uh, While well, because of the weather this week, we won't be able to project it, but we hope soon to have the sunshine 24 hours a day, folks. We're going to launch it from the famous Bob and Ray Zeppelin, which was featured in a show that flopped a few years ago, the Zeppelinorama, that we uh, were behind at the time. Now, uh, Bob, you have the technical details there on the lights that are going to go into this satellite. And, uh, well, I don't want to get too technical because well, it does run into... For those who listen, uh, who are scientifically bent, uh, maybe they will uh, glean something from this. Yes. Well, uh, I hope you're listening then. Uh, it's going to be powered. Well, not powered, actually. Now I'm using the wrong word. Yeah. Uh, it's going to have something like 16 to 20 candles inside this thing that's about the size of a beach ball. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to send it off the first of next, next week, and we hope that... Uh, We'll be able to tell you more about it. Maybe you'll be able to see it out there in space. You know, yeah. space is way out there, and it's way out. And Boy. if we can get it out there, we also hope to man it. We want to send Wally Ballou with it. Uh, I haven't spoken to him about it yet, but if he will go, we're certainly all That's ready. Right. We hope point. to uh, fill the satellite with uh, two lights that will burn all the time and Wally Ballou. And... Uh, the only problem right now is to get it round. We haven't. We've got little lumps in this thing, uh, this satellite. And if we can smooth those off and make it round, it'll probably work much better. We think. So, uh, <clears throat> but that's enough. We don't want you to think that uh, we haven't been keeping up with science, folks, here at the Bob and Ray Laboratory. So you keep watching the sky. If you see a bright light. It'll be that. Child psychology from a Zickening point of view. Dr. Horace W. Zickening here with us in our studio. We have quite a lot of mail that's piled up here, and I want to get right to the questions from uh, Tucson, Arizona. Mrs. Leipzig McGee writes that her son would like to become a movie star. He's four years old. How can I explain to him uh, just uh, why this would be impossible? Well, uh, Well, maybe you don't think it would be impossible, Doctor. Uh... So I'd uh, tell this woman that uh, this child of four years has uh, hardly reached the age of reason. So uh, she would have to talk slowly. And this I recommend in all cases. Never raise the voice when you're speaking to a child. It only frightens him. Explain to him in simple language how uh, at four years it's impossible for him to become a movie star. Explain mm-hmm. it over to him several times so that you're sure he understands. In other words, that the long climb to Hollywood fame, Mm -hmm. to 
uh, through dramatic lessons and uh, screen tests and so forth, would be well out of his reach. That's right. And then if he persisted uh, in this desire, whack him. All right. Well, Doctor, I think we have maybe time for one more here. This is from uh, Mr. Farbinger Thurkle, who says his son, Farbinger Thurkle, Jr., this is similar to the other case, would like to become a sheep herder, and uh, all the time is talking about that. What can he do? Certainly that one has humorous overtones. Yeah, how old is this young fellow? He's eight. Wants to be a sheep herder. Here again, uh, it's a simple case of explaining to the boy uh, that sheep herding isn't all that it probably uh, is painted to be, mm-hmm. that uh, the remuneration probably isn't too great, and that there are other handicaps of being a sheep herder, as we know. Explain to him also that probably by the time he reaches uh, 21... Uh, he probably wouldn't be interested in it. Explain to him in a quiet voice and try to make as much sense as possible to him. And then if he still persists, whack him! Well, what do they do at a remote rural firehouse? We thought now you might be interested in hearing a cribbage game being played at the Ogunquit Main Fire Department Firehouse. Molly Maloo speaking. And the game has been on now for about two hours. And uh, so far, it's a tie crib, four games up. to four. My crib's on deal. That's right. There you are. Okay, throw him away. Yeah, that's what he's away. You You're cut. Crib, huh? Yeah, you cut. Okay. Oh, there's a jack. <laughs> you get two one, for that. Okay, you'll need it. Uh, um, eight. Fifteen for two. And another seven, twenty-two for two. Twenty-five. Uh, Thirty-one for two. Uh, I got fifteen, two. 15. I get one for the last card there. Oh, yeah. Fifteen, two, fifteen, four, two, eight or twelve. Fifteen, six. You don't need to look at mine. You can take my word for it. Nineteen. The two players of the playoff here. Yeah, nineteen on that counting one. Counting each other's hands. The left hand player just got nineteen. And that would make well, it. You can't have nineteen. Somebody said he can't have nineteen. That's my wife, Mr. Below. What do you have to butt in on it for? No. Well, it looks as if a fight may start at any moment. See, I'll count again. Fifteen, two, fifteen, four. How to get up again? Fifty-six. Run of three is nine. Two is eleven and ten. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Fifteen. No. You don't know how to count. That's your big trouble. Well, sir, fifteen, two, fifteen, four, fifteen, six. A run of three is nine. Fifteen. All you got is eight there. Now let's see. 15. And I got twelve, and that puts me out. Wait just see a him? Count him. Go on, count him there. Well, let's see. You have 52. Oh, I can see eight. I don't see where you get 12 out of that. See them four there? Now, listen Two here. Pair. That makes four. Wait just a minute. I've been playing cribbage here with you for good many years. You don't have to start 12, getting puppy with me. Put me up. <laughs> And here with us, uh, the man with a rather interesting job that we picked uh, out of the audience just a few moments ago. Mr. Bird, I think your name is. Is that right? Yes. B-Y or B-I-R-D? B-Y. What's your first name? Fleming. Fleming Bird. Do you mind if I call you Fleming? Certainly. Mr. Bird, you work in a finger nail clipper factory. Is that right, as a tester? That's right, sir. I test the... Fingernail clipper itself. Uh, the uh, uh, edge, the sharp edge, see if it cuts. I've seen these uh, advertisements saying that each clipper has been tested. How do you go about that, sir? How do you do it? Well, uh, I clip. Don't use your own fingernail. Yes, I do. Do you really? Yes. Uh, I, of course, can only uh, test 12 a day that way. Well, clippers. I see. And you're going to. Uh, that doesn't make very much of an output, then. You're not the only tester there, are you? Yes, I am. 
So when you work a five-day week, that's 60 clippers a week they turn out. See, 12 times 5. 60. 12, 12 2 is a 24. 12. No, it's 2 fives is a 10, two 1 five. 5 is 5, and carry 1 there. 60. Maybe 60. That'd be 60 a week. That's right. And they, they, well, they get a quarter apiece for them. Uh, yes, 25 cents a piece they get for them. That's $15, isn't it? Well, let's see, 25. Well, listen, this isn't important. I, I, I wanted you to actually test one. Wait, wait a second. 25 times, what was that figure you had? Well, sir, our time is a little bit valuable here. We, we don't have all day. 25 times 5. <laughs> five fives would be I 25. Just I was thinking the economics of Would the you thing. carry it too there? Yes, I think you so. Would. Now, will you test one of these uh, clippers? I, I'd, I'd like to see you do that. <clears throat> well, I saved one thing now so I could test it. Here. One hand, you mean? Yes. Uh, all right. There. That's one. And now another. <clears throat> that does work. Good. Now, can you tell at this point whether the clipper is in good shape? Yes. These three have been fine. All now. right. The fourth one. Mm -hmm. Now the fifth one. And the sixth one. <laughs> Well, there you have an actual demonstration of how these uh, fingernail clippers are tested. Thank you very much, uh, Fleming Bird. What's that, 25 times 5? Yeah, I'll get with you. Oh, yeah. Happy to welcome back today, and especially with the additional network uh, affiliations that we have, the Regional Coordinator of Interbureau Administration for the Northeast States, Clyde L. Whartney, or Hap, as he is known to us here. Hap, it's a pleasure to see you again. Well, first of all, uh, Bob, I want to thank you, uh, your, your employers, and the entire network for making this time available to uh, me and my office absolutely free. Hap, I know a great many things have taken place down at the Interbureau Coordination uh, Administration yes, since we've, we've seen you, and I wonder if you'd bring us up to date a little bit. Well, as you know, we have an office here in New York. We have a uh, field office in Rutland, Vermont, and we cover the six New England states, Pennsylvania, and Indiana, and it's our hope to be opening shortly field office in Muncie, Indiana. You now, I'd like first... Excuse me. Go ahead. Oh, you ahead. Uh, you still have uh, quite a sizable number of uh, men in the field uh, reporting in on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. I wonder if you'd tell us how the cooperation with your administrators in the field has been. Uh, the cooperation has been excellent. However, the morale at my office is at a low ebb, as you know. Would you I... like me to hold that ice cream cone for you? No, this is all right. Thank you. All right. As you know, uh, we have not had any money forthcoming from Washington... We've been functioning now for over a year. Now, that's so that when I get into the office on, well, say, Monday morning now, I'll get these shifty glances from all the employees because they haven't been paid in over a year. I've made several trips to Washington to find out who my immediate supervisor is. Nobody seems to know. Well, you're still working on the basis of Army directives, isn't that right? We have one office here, and in it we have about 12 folding uh, chairs, mm -hmm. uh, one desk, a phone, and a complete list of Army regulations. So that's think. the only uh, uh, book that we have to go by. Um, well, in other words, you haven't been able groups. to get any satisfaction. Go ahead. I haven't been able to uh, get any satisfaction uh, down in Washington as to where the money's going to come from. Well, I can imagine that there should be uh, but, a little uh, bit of... Uh, I'm an optimist at heart, and because of that, I've gone ahead and leased four more floors in the building where I am and have uh, taken on uh, 250 more employees who will be typing the records that our field men will be bringing and in. you're from still time coordinating, time. collating the we'll records, sending them on to Washington on a regular basis. And sending it on to Washington and, on a regular uh, so basis. They will know so what so you're doing. They'll all know what we're doing down there. All right, sir. Well, thank you very much for bringing us up to date. And uh, anything further that you have to report, uh, make sure that uh, you bring it to us first, will you please? Clyde L. Hap Whartney of the Interbureau Regional Coordination Administration for the Northeast States, Pennsylvania, and Indiana. Yeah, Let me have 15 cents to get home. We call in correspondent Wally Ballou at the Detergent Box Derby, Uphill Falls, Oregon. Will you Ballou at the Detergent Box Derby, as we have uh, reason to believe you've been told that they push these little wagons that they have built themselves up this hill. Yes, sir. Correction here, Wally. Here's I the have a hard ladies and point gentlemen. Point out uh, that uh, rather than mislead the public, they all these kids did not build these themselves. They could have help from their fathers. I think that it's probably proper 
That, uh, we mentioned that, uh, Wally. Hulu, uh, from my vantage point, a scene of panoramic beauty spread out uh, up ahead of me. And you're right, Artie. And as a matter of fact, looking over these little cars, I would say that in 90% of the cases, the old man uh, made it for the youngster. Uh, just a correction on your figures. Uh, before we were on the air, uh, Wally, I took time out to check with the chairman of the derby. He tells me that there are only forefathers, actually, who helped any of these kids. Well, considering there are only five in the race, I would say that was pretty near 90%. Well, uh, actually, it wouldn't be 90%, you know. Uh, If you know your mathematics, Wally, uh, that would be one... Excuse me just a minute, Artie. I think uh, it's been made known to you now uh, that out of the five who started, only four are expected to finish. One dropped out. Well, uh, true. However, uh, I think I was still correct, to Wally, in saying that there were five uh, contestants vying for the honors here at the Cajun <laughs> Rock Terry. <laughs> well, at that time, yes. When I said 90% of the contestants' cars had been built by their fathers, uh, there were five, and I was wrong. But now, actually, 100% of the four contestants still in the running uh, cars were built by their fathers. That's all I can say about that. Right, and I think probably the term <laughs> running is wrong, Wally. Uh, oh. You know, these are just the regular boxes, and uh, there is no motor in them, oh, and well, they're pushed uphill. Uh, so right. I think when you say oh, running right. in the race, I well, think that's the... Uh, uh, running I used term. as a purely rhetorical phrase. That's right. I didn't uh, I mean that the cars are running by themselves <laughs> or under any car uh-huh. or anybody else. Yeah, but it's just that the lungs are on the air, and people would like to know exactly what's going on. I think if you use a better choice of words, Here's it probably would Here's a note just to me. It says, get on with the description of this detergent box derby, and I think that's a good idea. Take it away, Artie Skerberhide. Thank you, Wally Baloo, for my vantage point. They're now about a third way up the uphill falls. This hill rises about 700 feet. They started, uh, oh, scarcely 40 minutes ago. I would estimate that they are, have accomplished probably 300 yards. All these little fellas who are... Well, just a minute, Artie Skerberhide. The entire race is only 280 yards. Uh, therefore, they couldn't have accomplished 300 yards at this time. Now, look, uh, Wally, if you'd care to take just a little time out to take a look at the map that was handed to both of us by the committee the, here. I have the map right here. All right, just take a look at it now. Does that look like 200 yards to you, Paula? Hey, it looks like 200, but I'm told it's 280 yards, and I don't think there's any need to argue about it while we're on well, the air. I, I, I don't think it's just this Well, you do. Every time we do a remote broadcast, you try to make an idiot out of me, Wally. I'm not trying to make any idiot out of you, Artie, any more than you're already doing. Uh, when you say the 280 yards is the same as 200 or 300. Go ahead, Wally. That's all I have to say from my vantage point. Oh, that's all you have to say. <laughs> <laughs>